while America and Japan are diplomatically trying to resolve their conflicts, Japan's military leaders are secretly moving forward with their plan to rule the entire Far East, starting with the United States Pacific Fleet. In Tokyo in the autumn of 1941, relations between Japan and the United States grow steadily more strained. U.S. Ambassador Joseph Brew informs Washington that Japan might well strike with dangerous and dramatic suddenness. Attempts to affect conciliation of differences are continued, but to no avail. In an effort to weaken the Japanese threat to the Pacific world, severe economic restrictions are imposed by the U.S. Japan's exports drop off sharply, and the economy of the country is violently upset. On Sunday, December 7, 1941, Secretary of State Cordell Hall works in vain on attempts at a solution to the crisis. But negotiations end abruptly. He receives two callers, envoys Nomura and Caruso, who inform him that the Japanese and American positions are irreconcilable. In Washington, President Roosevelt does not agree to Japan's demands and embargoes oil, which leaves the massive Japanese fleet critically short. War is inevitable. November 26, 1941. The Japanese carrier fleet leaves Japan. It takes them 11 days to sail, undetected, 4,000 miles, putting them only 200 miles short of Hawaii. And although the Americans have broken the Japanese codes, they still have not found out where they might strike. December 2nd, 1941. The Japanese fleet receives the code, climb Mount Nikataka. That irrevocably orders the attack. December 7th, 1941, 6 a.m. The first of 400 Japanese bombers and torpedo planes take to the air. a.m. The United States Navy destroyer, USS Ward, makes contact with an unidentified submarine. The radio warning from the Ward is put aside. A second warning comes as a radar station on the Opana Point picks up a flight of unidentified aircraft. The officer on duty disregards a radio message sent to Fort Schaffner. It is thought to be a flight of American B-17s coming in from the mainland. 7.53 a.m. The unthinkable is about to happen. The Japanese are zeroing in on Pearl Harbor, just as Billy Mitchell predicted. Kanoe, Wheeler, Iwa, Bellows, and Hickam airfields are all hit at once to prevent a counterattack. Upon learning they were under Japanese attack, the lieutenant on duty at Ford Island Naval Air Station immediately orders all radio men to send out the dispatch, Air Raid Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. Ironically, due to fear of sabotage by Japanese islanders, all aircraft have been parked in neat rows in the middle of the airfields so they could be closely watched. They were perfect targets. The Japanese torpedo planes head into battleship row. Ten torpedoes slam into the side of the USS Oklahoma. She capsizes 
and sinks. The West Virginia takes nine torpedoes and begins to sink. The crew of the USS Arizona scrambles to their battle stations. Overhead, a Japanese aircraft takes aim. After seven misses, an armor-piercing bomb makes its way through the forward turret of the USS Arizona, immediately igniting tons of ammunition and thousands of gallons of fuel oil. The explosions are simultaneous, killing over 1,100 men instantly. The ignited fuel oil pours out of the wrecked hull of the Arizona and down Battleship Row, igniting the waters around the crippled U.S. fleet. Within two hours, total personnel killed 2,388, wounded 1,178. The Arizona's casualties makes up almost half of the total casualties at Pearl Harbor. The USS Arizona burns for three days before anyone can set foot upon her.